Welcome to the Life Process Program YouTube channel, or if you're tuning in on a podcast app, welcome to the LPP podcast. The Life Process Program is an online coaching program developed by Dr. Stanton Peel. At LPP, we help people get past addiction and move on with life. You're listening to a weekly segment of our podcast called Sundays with Stories. Every Sunday morning, my co-host, Dr. Stanton Peel, and I summarize addiction-related news of the week, but we give these stories a fresh spin. We focus on the fact that an overwhelming majority of addicted people mature out of their addiction over time, and most do so without fanfare, and we're trying to shine a light on these people and their stories and stories related to them that are missed due to a media insistence that addiction stories have to be tragic, drugs have to be bad, and even success, success stories have to be framed as a person hanging on for dear life, always struggling to keep their demons at bay, no matter how much time has passed. So to learn more about the psychology of addiction and common sense strategies for developing greater balance in life, visit our website at lifeprocessprogram.com. Once again, I'm Zach Rhodes, and I'm here with the creator of the Life Process Program, psychologist, Dr. Stanton Peel. Stanton, thanks for being with me today. Good morning, Zach. It's nice to see you as always. Stanton, I had, a, I had an idea in the can for today, but then I picked up a New York Times I still read um, physical newspapers. And I on the front page was a story about alcohol that I, by necessity, I, I had to switch to this responding to the story. It's called, Even a Little Alcohol Can Harm Your Health, research shows. Now, I know that you are, um, since you're always sort of scanning for, to for articles and sources about this issue, you're constantly fielding and trying to absorb this information and then spit it Which back is, out in a, in a way that's meaningful. We're and it's always. So this is nothing new to you. It just happened to be just the tone of this article and then a contradiction made it very interesting to me. Still not uh, by, by no means rare. So here it is. Uh, here's a sneak peek at what the article's about and what it entails and the contradiction that I saw in the article. The overall claim, I mean, at least the tone, or the narrative seems to insinuate even moderate alcohol intake is going to lead to liver deterioration or cardiovascular health issues and some kinds of cancer. So it's bookended. At the front of the piece is this line several times that even a small amount of alcohol is bad for health. And it, it made sure to say, despite what research you may have been listening to or reading or absorbed that says, you know, you should you could drink in moderation and things could be good. No, no, no. You need to refrain from that line of logic. But at the end, it, I think that there was a heroic effort on the part of the journalist, uh, Dana Smith, to ask people, all right, so what should people do? And no one could say you should abstain from alcohol. Everybody said, well, it's a piece of the puzzle. And, you know, and no one's going to say stop drinking altogether if you're living basically healthy. So I thought that contradiction was interesting in and of itself. I have a task for listeners or viewers of this program. So for each of the claims from the article that I'm about to throw out there, um, ask yourself, and we'll guide this one, compared to what, whatever the claim is, say, compared to what, and then is that claim true in the first place? So let's, I'm gonna, we're going to practice this. The first claim, alcohol causes liver damage. By the way, they're talking about no distinction between excessive drinking, which um, by some standards is something like two or more a day for men and over, over one a day for women drinks. Excessive drinking is bad for your health, but even small amounts of alcohol can lead to liver deterioration. Hmm. So they're trying to say, you might be thinking of uh, liver disease as, you know, if you're a heavy drinker, excessive drinker. No, no, not a, just an excessive drinker, any alcohol. So my first question is, okay, if you drink anything, then you're likelier to get some sort of liver deterioration or disease. And I'm trying to compare that to other things that people do, like, you know, does over-the-counter medication like Tylenol, Advil, cold medicine used too frequently. Does that hurt your liver? 
do prescription medications that doctors give you that are perhaps life preserving in some sense. I'm talking about um, iron for anemics or um, meds that people take for their heart, too many supplements, salt, sodas. Uh, these are all things that we intake all the time as a population. And there is no laser focus on too much salt, too much Advil, too much anything, not in the way that there is about alcohol. So the question is, are these things by themselves, are they ever the sole focus of researching and reporting? I mean, maybe they are in research, but certainly not, you know, barrages of articles about them. And the last thing I'll say about that is drinking alcohol is a social activity. It's relaxing. So is drinking in moderation with the ability to relax and socialize, is that better for you and your liver than abstaining and being anxious or being impaired socially? Like I'll even, let's, let's grant, even if it's not true that some, any alcohol causes liver damage. What are you weighing that against is my question. They did the first international study of the effects of alcohol. <clears throat> um, it's the comprehensive European study of alcohol use. And they divided the world, Europe, into three zones. Northern Europe, Central Europe, and Southern Europe. Northern Europe consumed the least alcohol, Central Europe an intermediate amount, and Southern Europe, which means Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy <clears throat> the most. Then they measured alcohol-related <laughs> mortality, and the greatest contributor to that was cirrhosis. Which sector had the lowest cirrhosis level. Drinkers had the lowest. The Southern Europeans had one third of the level of alcohol cirrhosis, men and women. Men had like much more, but it was still a third exactly. And in Northern Europe, they had the most and Central Europe was intermediate. Do you, uh, you don't spend a ton of time in Europe, but. Do you have any thoughts about why that may be true? Well, there's a there's a there's a way that people drink in those right. different sections of Europe. I mean, one is to enhance life and to supplement other things people are doing in life, and then there's a way of drinking that's <clears throat> that's meant to uh, that's ir irresponsible. That's a whole nother section of life. There's life, and then there's drinking to get away from life. One form of mortality is accidents. And they have much lower accident levels, which that you can sort of register in your mind, right? If you don't go out on a weekend and get really drunk, you're going to have fewer accidents. That's easy. <clears throat> but there's actually, even though they drink more alcohol, if you actually count it all up in Italy than in Norway, they actually have less significantly less cirrhosis and how does that work and it sort of gets into your common sense way of thinking about it if you're drinking alcohol in a moderate setting and a relaxed setting regularly that'll add up to a certain amount of alcohol as opposed to going out and blitzing yourself often with a lot of hard liquor in a really intense drinking episode one of those things has to be less healthy than the other and Everybody in the world knows that. Um, because there's so, when you say, well, normal people read this and they sort of think, well, if I drink some wine at dinner with my wife and maybe even with my children, if I'm Italian or Jewish, that just can't be unhealthy. It's been, it's been done for centuries and it doesn't, jibe with sound it doesn't seem unhealthy given what i know about life there seems to be a lifestyle drinking or no drinking uh, that is predictive of longevity and at the same time there's a uh, proof in the pudding clarification of well there's lower cirrhosis in places where people drink more uh, uh more people drink but perhaps drink differently than places that they're not and they even drink 
the, the country drinks more overall because there's more people drinking regularly. So right. that adds up to less liver damage and in a way that makes common sense to everything you as a human being know about health and behavior that you would just tell your child, well, if you drink moderately in a positive setting and you have food and good convivial connection, that's healthy. So the Times would respond to that. Uh, they're, they're trying to get away with something. And they're saying about a fifth of people with impaired liver function are people who drink moderately. Well, the rest of them, okay, it's ac- it's excess. It's And the Times, nor its interviewees, uh, didn't specify what else is happening in the lives of that one-fifth of people. So just to eat one last add-on. Were they smoking? Were they obese? Were they taking too much iron, supplements? over-the-counter drugs, just the correlation that even though four-fifths of people who were drinkers who had liver damage, um, well, there's also this one-fifth who are moderate drinkers, if so facto, but nothing else about lifestyle. This is almost, this piece could be called, let's ignore lifestyle and focus on alcohol. Well, I even before the second- at that point, if somebody came to you and said, there are very, only a small percentage of people are heavy and over drinkers. If somebody represented the data that you just said and said, 80% of cirrhosis liver damage occurs for heavy drinkers who are- Who were also, right. Who are an extremely small percentage of overall drinkers, then that's going where you're going. What comparison you're making Right. Your middle note is, oh, I shouldn't be a heavy drinker. That there's only a very small likelihood of me getting liver damage, and people do get liver damage. That happens. That's highly unlikely. If in that, uh, um, if I'm in that larger group, uh, who is on very unlikely to get liver damage from drinking. Claim two, it, the big hammer over the head of alcohol on any level is the claim is any amount of alcohol at all can lead to cardiovascular illness such as afib high blood pressure now you're going to talk about data that refutes that precisely refutes that and so this is a bugaboo of of yours well we don't have to ask the compared to what question anymore i think we covered it once so when we're asking okay there's there could be risks associated if you grant that logic compared to what? I mean, do you have to abstain completely from alcohol? This this is something that came, uh, if, if, this is a Canadian source. Um, about a 20, this is the Heart and Stroke Canada. In these studies, people who drank moderate amounts of alcohol, less than two drinks a day most days, had about a 20% lower risk of dying from heart disease, including heart attack, atrial fibrillation, heart failure, and coronary artery disease, when compared to those who didn't shrink. This trend seems to hold for people who are living with heart disease and those who aren't. Even if you have heart disease and you are a drinker, it seems to be a benefit when you're drinking. Exactly. That's like, that is printed at the heart and stroke Canada website. It's almost that's almost like blessing the devil. So then they, and then they go on to say, and the benefits are seen whether drinking beer, wine, or spirits. These findings can be reassuring for most folks, but they are certainly not a recommendation to start drinking for health benefits. It's almost like they've just said you're less likely to die of heart disease, even if you have heart disease, if you drink moderately, but nobody should ever start drinking on that account. Okay. There's a, there's a rational way to, to there's, there's a logic behind that. If only there weren't floods of articles and anything good said about alcohol always comes with a caveat, but the, that is sort of like we say, you know, we're trying to get people to imagine through addiction. Well, you know, what one enormous life source is, some new life change that often leads people to just kind of mature away from addiction, having a child. But we wouldn't say, 
you know, go out and have a child that ought to cure it. So there's a reasonable way to say, you know, don't, I'm not saying just start putting them back, be thoughtful, but it's it, the, the suspect, the skepticism comes from every article that comes in either says drinking's bad at any level, or once you have to be honest because you're presenting research, you have to frame it like there could be, you know, benefits. And by God, even if you have heart disease, there could be benefits while you're drinking and make sure this is the, this is the obligatory sentence that says, you know, don't drink still. Right. Right. The World Health Organization has conducted the global burden of disease study. And in 20, which it's an unbelievable, it measures every single country in the world, how much disease is caused and then what its cost is from every source. And it's led by World Health Organization epidemiologists, and they collaborated with people in every country in the world. In 2017, they re released the result which said no, which is, sounds like the headlines you were hearing. No amount of drinking alcohol is safe, which is a sort of funny way to put it. Last year, as I wrote in Influence, they did the results of that alcohol up through 2020, and they measured 204 countries. And they found something which is unbelievable. Muslim countries where you're sort of not allowed to drink, poor countries, rich countries. <clears throat> and when they combined all of the results, and, and the dependent measure was life years lost through death and disability. In the summary table for every human being on the planet, Abstainers lost more life years than drinkers by disability and death. They don't say that in the summary of the article. Um, they don't say that even in the data analysis, they say alcohol results vary by gender and by age. Women and men differ and different age groups vary. Um, between 18 and 40, um, your drinking is more likely to reduce lifespan. After 40, there's a slight advantage. After 65, there's a substantial advantage in lifespan for drinkers. And technically, that's because most people only start to die of heart disease in their 40s. And it becomes a common form of death in your 60s. So it only tops out in your 60s. But then on the other hand, you're probably only a moderate drinker in your 60s if you were all through your life. So when they combined mm -hmm. the entire Michigas, they found that people over the entire world population who drink between one and a half and two <clears throat> standard drinks a uh, a day at that point only then do they become as likely to die or lose life years as lifetime abstainers drinking on the lesser side of that means you'll outlive a drink, uh, a lifetime abstainer by the way technical question why do they call why do they compare it to lifetime abstainers do you think Lifetime abstainers haven't had a drink, so you've got a control there. Well, all, all public health recommendations in America say you should drink less when you're older. The World Health Organization found that for people over 60, the greatest benefit for men and women, the greatest benefit and least likelihood of losing life years were for people who drank close to three drinks daily. I mean, it's like saying don't eat broccoli when you're over 60 because of the risks of choking. You know, it's like it really is like their advice is deadly advice. NBC had a special 
about cancer labeling for alcohol. All right, now I'm going to do some heavy quiz questions. Um, and the and and they interviewed a woman, Mensimer, who wrote a cover story for Mother Jones magazine, which said that alcohol research was lying because it compared um, abstainers, people who've quit drinking. It, it was a remarkably ignorant article. She was interviewed last week on NBC about whether they should label alcohol as causing cancer. I'm the only person in the world who knows that she's changed her story. She claimed in the article that most research was sponsored by alcohol manufacturers. In the interview, all she said was we should put that label on alcohol so people will be cognizant. Which is, she's changed her story. Her story's wrong. Right. After she wrote the article, people, the World Health Organization kind of hates alcohol. Uh, she doesn't know about that study. That's something that came after. So uh, here's a couple more quiz questions. Um, I bet she doesn't know the answer to these questions. What do most people in America die of? Men and women. Cardiovascular disease. Yes. People die of heart disease more than all cancers combined. Mm hmm um, what is the largest source of death by cancer for women? Nobody knows the answer to this. It's lung yeah. cancer. People say breast cancer because that's what they, they, they hear breast cancer, and, and sometimes people say breast cancer, I've heard people say this, is the largest killer of women. That's actually very rare, uh, even among, as far as cancers go. Ten times as many women die of heart disease as breast cancer. And yeah. we're not in favor of breast cancer. And if you have a breast cancer gene, who knows what that means for you? The main claim is that the danger of alcohol comes from the fact that it enhances cancer. Um, I, the idea that alcohol causes, nobody claims alcohol in moderate amounts causes heart disease. Nobody. Some people argue that, uh, many people now argue that the claim that moderate drinking reduces heart disease, they'll question that thing. So um, <clears throat> that, that, that just is, not done any anywhere and canadian uh, heart and disease society reports that well maybe it's not that true that um as it's often reported that alcohol can create uh, heart benefits but then mm -hmm. they argue Backwards from that, they say there have been a large number of studies that have found lower heart disease, starting with, starting with the first and original study of all time, which is called the Framingham study. They were surprised to find that drinkers, moderate drinkers, had fewer heart attacks than abstainers. That finding has happened throughout history. And so the anti-alcohol forces mainly warn against that. Um, but it's good to know that you're going to die of heart disease. And when you start looking at the World Health Organization, and, and so I wrote an article for Filter, which says, should we put a label that alcohol can lead to cancer? Fair enough, as long as you also put a label saying um, alcohol tends to reduce heart disease and overall increase your longevity. So, you know, this is a secret message we're giving here. You can, any human being can choose to abstain for whatever reason in the world. They can decide alcohol is evil. Um, they can believe all of this stuff. And we're saying that's your choice. It's a free world. God bless you. You might think alcohol is bad for you. And you have trouble drinking. That's fine. The flip side is 
that that is in and of itself, I'm going to say it now, abstinence from alcohol is a mortality health risk. Boom. You kind of covered some general claims. You covered the claim about cirrhosis and liver damage. We covered the claim about cardiovascular health. We covered a claim about cancer in general, which by the way, they grant, the, the writer grants, okay, it seems like there's no conne- there's no real connection to cancer between alcohol and cancers. Although it seems like with some rare cancers, like esophageal and breast cancer, now there could be some correlation there. It's like, it's like really Can trying to reach for, what's that? It's tenuous and the guy- ten- ten- Tenuous at best and it's a reach and it's a whole column about you know, one of the three, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to show you. Um, so I'll just skip to the end. There's a contradiction at the end of the article, despite the title and despite the entire push throughout the article to shine a light on this toxic um, nature of drinking at all ever, which he, he really wants to hammer that point home. The last two paragraphs even with a valiant effort to try to get people to say otherwise. I can only imagine the questions that were asked, um, probably something like, can you give a give a plug about, since out any amount of alcohol causes all this crap, can you tell us what people should do? And almost like maybe they thought, well, the obvious answer is stop drinking, and then that's a nice ender. But it seems like no matter what, which ask, experts they ask, none of them would say, well, you should abstain completely. We, no, they said they they actually had to say none of the experts we spoke to suggested abstaining completely unless doing so you think is helpful, especially with alcohol use disorder. Or if you're pregnant, you should abstain while you're pregnant. But no one made a claim about lifelong abstinence from alcohol. And then another doctor, said, the I'm not, another doctor said, I'm not going to advocate that people stop drinking completely. Dr. Koob said, we tried prohibition. It didn't work. In other words, any alcohol is too much alcohol. Small amounts of alcohol lead to increased risks of horrible diseases, but no need to stop. And so you have to, when you read an article like that, that spins in all different sorts of dimensions of messaging, you have to wonder how reliable it is and where exactly they're coming from. And it's almost like, I think I've mentioned this before, it's sort of like original sin to, to laud alcohol and to say that you can. And anyone can get away with saying you should do it less. So I'm not going to advocate that people completely stop drinking, Dr. Koop says. <clears throat> mm-hmm. The last paragraph is admit none of the experts, none of the experts we spoke to suggested abstaining completely unless doing so helps with alcohol use disorder or you're pregnant. So that's the, that said, we agree with that. If you decide that you're a person who can drink safely, you're allowed to quit drinking. God bless you. And being pregnant is a whole other kind of caboodle. Other than that, they don't recommend to anybody that they abstain. Now read the title of the article again. Just Even remind- a little alcohol can harm your health, research shows. So is that title actually dangerously misleading to people absolutely george koob the one who said that Mm -hmm. is an internationally recognized expert on alcohol and stress yeah and the neurobiology of alcohol and drug addiction he is the director of the national institute on alcohol abuse and alcoholism so there's two things about that he's pretty well informed and even he is not going to tell you to abstain from alcohol he <clears throat> has every reason why he would love it if he could say in earnest don't drink alcohol that would be a nice easy thing for him to do he has every reason to say that but Let's he can't that another it's way not true. would he disagree with the title of his institute national institute on alcohol abuse and alcoholism that's that's his job that, and you're saying, well, that it would be good if you could say, oh, never drink alcohol. But since he can't say that, the other way we would, might go, which is never, ever going to happen in my lifetime or yours, is why don't we call it the National Institute on Alcohol Use? Which is like 
there's a National Institute on Mental Health. Mm. And you can have mental health or you can have mental dishealth. They all come under that category. The Na- if they change the name, which will never happen in America, the National Institute on Alcohol Use, they're saying, well, alcohol is widely used, can have positive properties, and sometimes can be misused. We're going, Dr. Kube is the director who wants to uh, cover those range of outcomes and to encourage America individually and as a country towards the positive side of that spectrum. That would be like a normal human being, public health way of thinking. Well, that's sort of what I'm saying is that Dr. Koop in all likelihood doesn't consider or doesn't worry about the contradiction between his own title and his statement in that article. Then the author of this article worries about the contradiction between their title and Dr. Koop's statement. I'm just saying this is, this is ubiquitous. This is right. they only an article. Well, I don't know if this is true, but in my world, it seems like only an article about drugs and about alcohol could have such a contradiction within it, glaring for people to see and people get Let's away. Summarize with, it. with your feeling that way. It's if you have if you're talking with somebody and they can only deal with something in an irrational way. If you talk to mm. somebody and they say, "Oh, sex is totally bad for people." you immediately would count them out and you would think, well, there you have some kind of clinical syndrome. You would say, well, this is not, this is not somebody who's an expert who you would want teaching at a school or talking to your children. But with alcohol and drugs, not only can that happen, but that's the preferred mode of dealing with these things. Right. And, um, we beg to disagree with that, that that's the best way of going about it. We like to offer an alternative way of thinking, which hopefully we made the case for today. And it's a part of our life process program. All things can be done in positive and negative ways. And sex happens to be one of the topics that we deal with. And people do have problems with them. There may even be people that should not get involved in relationships conceivably. Abstinence is one part of the spectrum, but it is not the dictated part of the spectrum. So I pluck this story out of the air almost like I plucked a dollar bill from one of those cyclone machines on a game show. And well, uh, but I figured why not this one? And it's it was short and digestible enough in terms of how it reads that I, I figured while we have clients in our program who are trying to consider exactly how to move forward with their lives, whether alcohol is a part of it, why not use this one? And so I hope people took these points and the logic and the, and the critical thinking behind it and could take that away and help make decisions in their lives. Thanks again, Stanton. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday, Zach.